Amen, amen. Welcome, everybody, to the You Can Make It radio broadcast. Glory to God, excited for this day that the Lord has made. And I'm going to give you a heads up, ladies and gentlemen. My house has been violated. <laughs> Glory to God. This, this young man of God wore an Ohio State shirt Yes. in the studio. Unbelievable. Sure Unbelievable. Is. But I love him because the Bible says so. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I want to introduce to you um, a good brother in the Lord, a man who's been in the ministry, grew up, um, I hate to say in the church, but grew up in God. Yeah. Amen. Um, young young man of God, I didn't know he was this young. Amen. But praise God that um, God has kept him throughout the ways. And um, we want to introduce to some and to those of you who may know him from the Pontiac area or maybe even Detroit or just the Michigan area. To Pastor Kyrie Stanley. Amen. Bless you, my man. Yeah, thank you for having me. Ain't no problem, man. To be here. Glad you didn't detour. Yeah. <laughs> Turn around from the traffic. <laughs> yeah. The glory to God. God. Tell tell the people about yourself, man. How, how are you? Uh, well, I'm glad to be alive. Amen. Uh, uh, I am the uh, pastor of church in Pontiac, Michigan, St. James Baptist Church. I've been married going on 14 years, have four children. Uh, and I'm just thankful that God decided to use me. I often say there's many people out there God, who God could have chose, you know, Amen. much better example than I am. Mm -hmm. But God chose to use me, and I'm ever grateful for it. Amen. Yes, sir. Amen. Um, and then I guess last week she said when God was calling her, she was she was nudging God like, mm -hmm, got the yeah. wrong person. How was that with you? It, you know, from a young age, I mean, very young, I knew that the Lord has something for me to do. Mm -hmm. Uh, and my grandmother would always tell me, you know, hey, the Lord's got a calling on you. And I didn't understand what it was. And so it was my pastor, uh, Pastor Solomon Smith Sr., right. who uh, took me under his wing and really nurtured me to understand what my calling was. And, uh, most people say that they ran from their calling. I ran to my calling because I knew Amen. deep down inside that that's what God would have me to do. Mm -hmm. um, I was uh, about... 10 years old on the playground, everybody outside playing. We were playing uh, hide go seek. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I closed my eyes to count because it was my turn to be it. And in the midst of that, I'll never forget Newman Court Apartments, Pontiac, Michigan. Um, the Lord opened the Bible right in front of me wow. and said, Preach my word. Amen. Uh, it was in an instant. I came back to, I think I was on seven. I was still counting, <laughs> but the Lord was speaking to me. And mm -hmm. uh, after that was over, I went back to church and I told my pastor what it was like. He was like, yeah, well, you just keep on waiting. If that's what the Lord wants you to do, he'll bring it out in you. And mm -hmm. I thank God for him doing that because most people think God called them to do something. And they run out and God ain't spoke to them yet. And so I thank him for making me put the brakes on. And two years later, I preached my first sermon Amen. at the age of 12. So I've been wow. in the pulpit. Long time. A long time. <laughs> and you don't under, people don't understand how difficult it is to be a preteen and a preacher at the same time. Yes. You know, everybody wants you to do their thing, but you know that you can't get involved in everything. But there were some times when I got involved in everything, and then I had to realize that who I was and I had to learn how to separate myself uh in certain things. You know, I made some silly mistakes mm -hmm. as a young guy. I think everybody has. But I thank God that he kept me and kept using me mm -hmm. in spite of all of those things. Was it difficult, the separation? It was. Being young? It was. Um, for years, you know, being talked about, being ridiculed, church boy, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I think everybody in school about ninth, 10th grade learned the word hypocrite. Mm -hmm. And so they were just throwing that around because I was different than they were. So 
I guess the biggest word they could think of, hypocrite. You know? <laughs> right. And so um, I never shied away from what God had called me to be. I mean, every day in school, I carried my Bible. I read my Bible. Um, but um, when I grew up and really learned what a hypocrite was, I was like, oh, man, I, they, wasn't, they didn't even know what they were talking about. Right. I knew I had a feeling they didn't know what they were talking about then. But when people that aren't like you see you mm-hmm. and they don't understand what's on you, Mm-hmm. They have to figure out a way to discredit you, right? And uh, that, and that's for any young person in church. You know, don't let what people don't understand about you discredit you. That's, that's what good. Paul said to Timothy. You know, don't let them despise you mm-hmm. because of your youth. Don't let them walk over you. Don't let them run you down because you're young. Uh, but you know, stir up that gift. And I, I just encourage anybody young in the ministry mm-hmm. to do that because a lot of people get called to ministry young. And for fear of what people say, mm-hmm. they run from it or they'll right. hide from it or they'll be a church boy at church and being a wild animal in public. But then, you know, that doesn't help you or your witness mm-hmm. later in life. So I, I think that goes to even um, in the family mm-hmm. where it's hard for them to accept, you know, the calling that God has on yeah. your life. And you don't even have to be young. You can be young in age, but then you can also be young in your calling. Yes, most definitely. And family has a hard time accepting and or respecting. Mm-hmm. You know, Jesus wasn't. You know, yeah. you know, his brothers was like in, in John chapter seven. He's like, go, go home, go out yeah, there, because you, you know, we sick of people coming to us yeah. talking about the stuff you're doing. That's right. You know, so no, won't you go on out there? It's like, go ahead, so we can see you get slaughtered. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you know what I would say to anybody that's young in life or in ministry, just be yourself. Mm-hmm. Okay, your family knows who you are. Those are the one people you don't have to hide from. Right. That's why I love my family. When I get together with my family, I can take off the preacher hat, you know, and I can just be cared. Right. And people in ministry need those moments. When I get home with my wife and my kids, I can be as silly as I want to. And uh, it gives me a chance to just take off some of the stuff that mm-hmm. I carry around. Right. So be yourself. And the the greatest blessing you could be to anybody that's around you, whether you minister unto them in words or in your action, is that they see you being you. Mm-hmm. I tell people all the time, God called you. He didn't call this person you made yourself to be. God called you. Just like with the woman at the well. He didn't tell her to forget about who she was. He mm-hmm. talked about who, who she, she was. was. Yes, he did. And who she was was able to go back into town and witness to all those people that she had been with. Mm-hmm. But if she had went into town acting holier than thou, she would have turned everybody away. So be yourself. Who you are is going to draw more people than who you think they want you to be. That's good. That's yeah. good because we sometimes we get caught up trying to emulate certain preachers all the, and, time. All, all the time and just however way you deliver you know i was telling them before you came i said now this brother he twist and turned and <laughs> kicked his leg up and you know i said in church you know i'd have been in traction <laughs> you know i'd have been in the hospital because <laughs> i can't do all that but under the anointing there's no telling what god will yeah. do yeah. but yet still as preachers we all have our own style Always. And we should perfect the style God has given us because it's yes. based off of who we are. That's right. There's a book that I uh, ran across some years ago called uh, Learning Your Voice. Yeah. Uh, every preacher has his own voice. Uh, my current pastor right now, uh, who I look up to beyond measure, is Dr. Tellis Chapman, okay. one of the greatest preachers in our time. And I've always wanted to live up to his caliber of preaching, uh, do what he does and say what he says. But he always reminds us that we are us. We can't be him. We can't mm-hmm. do him. I can look up to him and want to aspire to be at his level, but I can't be Tellus Chapman. I can only be Carrie Sanders. Right. And so every preacher, whether you like the way I preach or whether I like the way you preach, I still have to preach it the way God gave it to me. Mm-hmm. Because either I'm going to be genuine or I'm going to be a broke down copy of somebody mm-hmm. else. That's true. And you can either be who God called you to be, or you can be knockoff. Mm-hmm. And God doesn't God doesn't deal with knockoff. No. He makes his own creation. He don't, and knockoffs don't yeah, last. Don't long. last. 
you go to jail for having a knockoff purse. Yeah. So imagine what God's gonna do to you if you a knockoff for somebody else. Mm. Amen. You don't recognize yourself, and He don't recognize you either. Because mm-hmm. yeah. He's like, you you're not being who I called you to be. No. You know, He said, I didn't. You know, even twins are different. That's right. They look the same, but yeah. they're two different people. Yeah. And you know, I, I recently found that twins don't even have the same fingerprints. Yeah. They they still uniquely different. Yeah. So it's the same way, you know, like you said, for us to be unique in how God called us to be. You know, if you hoop, fine. If you don't hoop, if you're a teacher, teach. You know, teach. you don't preach, preach. If you got a hoop in you, then hoop. Yeah. But you don't know? try to make one up. Right. You know, you at home buying hooping tape. <laughs> 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 I'm going to learn how to do this like uh, so-and-so. Don't mm-hmm. do that. Right. Because you take yourself out of who God made you to be. Mm-hmm. You know, I wish that I could get out there and do uh, some of the great things that Bishop Jakes does. Right. But I'm not Bishop Jakes. Mm-hmm. And I don't know what <sighs> Bishop Jakes had to go through exactly. to get to where Bishop Jakes is. Mm-hmm. What Bishop Jakes is preaching now is his life experience with God. Mm-hmm. Trust me, I don't want to deal with what Bishop Jakes had to deal with to get where he is. And what he's dealing with now. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> All you see is what's on television. Right. So it's best to be you. Because when you learn who you are, God is going to bless you beyond measure. Mm-hmm. Because people, when they come to St. James, they don't see this image that I'm trying to put off because I'm who I am. When I come in your house, when I step in my pulpit, mm-hmm. when I walk in my front door, it's the same person. Right. No different. Because when you do that, you ain't doing nothing but confusing yourself. Because mm-hmm. you're going to get somewhere and forget who you were supposed to be mm-hmm. in that situation. And you don't say know what personality to tend to present. Yeah. So you got you, you schizophrenic because you got all these different personalities. That's right. Instead of just being yourself, I'm then me. you ain't got to worry about nothing else. Yeah, I can't help it. I'm me. I I'm don't me. apologize for me. You should for that shirt. Though. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you. <laughs> See, I got to get mine in because yeah. he don't get his yeah. back. Yeah. Have me changed my whole attire. Well, see, that's the difference between a true child of God and a poser. The poser has to go in the back and change to come out. And put on the form of godliness. You know what, saints? <laughs> Y'all be like, what did I, who did I not bring on this show today? But, you know, I did dress more professional today. But when I saw him, and he dressed you know, professional. You know, I don't put on my amazing blue. But anyway, <laughs> Lord God, I saw um, all the different schools you went to. Um, how has that helped you? And then has it hurt you in? But, you know... Uh, it shaped me into who I am today. Mm-hmm. Um, God uses every experience for his glory. Uh, I think the best decision I made in life was going to seminary. Mm-hmm. Uh, because if I'm going to be a good preacher, I have to understand preaching and church administration. Yes. Uh, now, seminary is a double-edged sword for any preacher going. Because if you don't have a good theology before you get there, Mm-hmm. You'll come out with something totally different. Um, you know, uh, a lot of times um, people, for me, I'll say for me, okay. going to seminary really changed how I view uh, what I believe. Okay. It made me look at it more so from what I heard to what I need to know for myself. And so I would encourage any young preacher to go out and get that knowledge. Mm-hmm. Uh, but make sure you have a solid foundation before you go out there because they're going to throw some philosophy in there and some yes. uh, different world religions in there. And if you're not careful, you'll want to quit school hmm. because you don't believe what you thought you believed. Right. So do do what God is directing mm-hmm. you to do. That, that's what I'll say. But it really has. It blessed me. It took me to some places as a young kid that I would have never gone if I hadn't gone to school. Mm-hmm. Yeah, especially being from Pontiac. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, I also noticed, too, that in, in today's time, where the church has, has adapted a lot of the, the business world, even though the church is a business to some mm-hmm. extent, because there's finances and things like that, but even when it comes down to the quality of knowledge as far as background, you know, like they want you to have a degree in the world and yeah. all this stuff. So yeah. now, now they want you to have a degree and they want you to have some training. Yeah. And you just spent thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars just to get this degree 
And, and the kids are like, well, how, where am I going to get the training from? Yeah. Um, yeah. Have you noticed that yeah. today where people want to know the school? Have you been to school? You know, what where type of degrees? You, yeah. Right. You know, and that's the downfall of many churches today. You know, they want you to have a master's degree in divinity. They want you to have pastor the church for five years before you come in to them, which only begs the question, who's doing the calling? God mm -hmm. or the people? Right. Most of those churches that have those ridiculous list of demands, that they call them qualifications on their thing, but that, those are demands. Mm -hmm. that, those preachers stay there for two years and then they go somewhere else uh, where they can use what God has given them. Mm -hmm. You know, the Bible never said that the people call pastors. Thank you. But Jeremiah, God to Jeremiah said, I will give you pastors mm -hmm. according to my own heart. I tell uh, the church all the time, you want to know God's heart for you? Look at your pastor. Mm -hmm. And if we put a premium on God instead of education, because that's a lot of educated fools. Mm -hmm. They got master's, doctorate degrees, PhDs. But when they get up in that pulpit, they have no spirit. Which is more important? Yes. Book knowledge or God? I'm glad you said that. Because God called 12 men that had mm -hmm. been to no school. Mm -hmm. Hadn't been to the temple, not one day. Right. But he used these 12, as they called them, unlearned men mm -hmm. to turn the world upside down. Now, you get that knowledge, but your knowledge ought not be on your systematic theology book and your um, Josephus and his historical writings, but it ought to be on God's word. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, God's word means more than Josephus. Yes, it does. It means more than all of these other historians, mm -hmm. John Bynum and Charles Spurgeon and all of those. Mm -hmm. They mean nothing if you're not preaching his word. Right. Because he said in John 14, I'm the way. Mm -hmm. Not Spurgeon. Spurgeon was a good guy, but he wasn't the way. Right. Gardner C. Taylor, great guy. Mm -hmm. He wasn't the way. Samuel DeWitt Proctor, good guy. Mm -hmm. He not the way. Kerry Stanley, he a decent guy, depending <laughs> on the day of the week. But what he's wearing. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Can't even be serious. <laughs> oh, go back. Go back to your serious. We'll have an altar call before we get out of here. <laughs> I got an extra Ohio State shirt in the car, too. Oh, man. Get you one, so you All know, right, you Dad. That's safe. our producer. You don't wear that one. <laughs> <laughs> but the premium ought to be in you knowing God. Mm -hmm. When I was a younger kid, those older saints wanted to know, did you know Jesus? Mm -hmm. When you came up to the front to acknowledge your calling to become a Christian, they wanted to know, did you know Jesus? They weren't concerned about your tongues and your dress and your shoes mm -hmm. and your stockings and your suit. Jesus was important. Mm -hmm. Pastor Solomon Smith used to always say all the time that you have to catch a fish before you can clean a fish. Mm -hmm. And if the church in this age is going to be successful, we have to learn that Jesus is in charge of the church. I find it funny that people in church want you to have a master's degree, but not one person out there in the congregation have one. That's true. I did a post the other day. Who, where, Where's the website that certifies preacher critics? Yeah. Yeah. Who who, who qualified you? Who certified you yeah. to say Most who's definitely. a good preacher? Yeah. And who's not? All you got to do is go into your meeting and ask them, okay, when was the last time you pastored the church? <laughs> Anybody that's pastored the church for five years or longer, raise your hand. And if nobody raised their hand, then you let them know that you got to listen to the person that's pastoring. Mm -hmm. God didn't send you here to lead. He sent me here to lead. And that's an issue in the church that you find nowhere else. You don't go into a boardroom at an Apple or a Google or a Microsoft. And find all them people telling the CEO which direction to go in. Mm. The church is the only place where people who God calls sheep get to have a meeting with the shepherd to tell the shepherd which way to go. When sheep mm -hmm. are prone to getting lost. Yes. And, it's the, the only and need place. guidance. But and they want the guy. But, you know, because they done been around a few shepherds, they think they know what a shepherd mm -hmm. does. You know? Or the fact that they, they've been there for so long and they done invested yeah. this money so I, they feel like this is my this is my pew, this is my spot. Not at all. And I have say so. I used to love and to hear, I used to love to hear Pastor Smith say this. He said, you know, if you think the church can't go on without you, die today. <laughs> They're gonna roll you in here, mm -hmm. they're gonna lie on you for a good 30 minutes, 
They're going to roll you out of here. They're going to come back. They're going to eat some chicken. They're going to go party. And Sunday morning, they're going to have devotion. The choir going to sing. The preacher going to sing. Preach. And church is going to go on, right? You don't think church is going to go on without you leave this church and go to another? Still going to continue. ain't going to shut the door down just because you're not there. Mm -hmm. The only place that seniority matters is in the plant. Yes. It don't matter in the church. Mm -hmm. No matter how long you've been there. And that's what turned these people that don't go to church away from church. Because everybody fighting over where they've been sitting for the last 30 years. How about where have you been serving for the last 30 mm. years? Your issue is you've been sitting. Yeah. And so now you upset because <laughs> somebody's sitting where you sit and you can't sit right if you're not sitting in your spot. Mm. Ain't no name. You've been to a church that had name tags on the seats? Mm. Yeah, really? <laughs> That's crazy. I know. And then you wonder why people walk down the street, look at your church and keep walking. Keep walking. I wouldn't go in there and I'm a Christian. Mm -hmm. If I'm a Christian, been in my been in church all of my life, and I don't feel comfortable in the mm -hmm. church, imagine what that person has never been in church feel like. Yeah. Because you know? there's a lot of Christians who don't even want to go to church. Have a hard time. There's a lot of Christians that are in the category of seekers right now. Mm -hmm. They go to church because, you know, grandmama went to this church, but they don't want to be there. Mm -hmm. If they could find a church today that met their needs, they'd be gone. Yeah. But you know what? The church, especially the Baptist church, the church that I belong to, is stuck in their way. This is how we do. It. You know what I mean? Every Baptist yeah. church you go to, that's their classic line. This is how yeah, you we don't do like it. how we do it. You got to go somewhere. Mm -hmm. And then those same people complain, why all the young folk leave? <laughs> well, I wonder why. Okay, okay. this is how we do it, right? Mm -hmm. If this is what we hold value, we have to be able to explain it to that new person. Right. We just can't say, this is how we do it. Mm -hmm. That's stupid. To me, if I'm a new person, I don't care how you do it. How do I fit in what you do? Right. That's what these young people want to mm -hmm. know. When they come in church and these kids ain't never been in church before, you can't expect them to sit down through a whole church service like you do. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. Kids in school don't even mm -hmm. sit down for a whole school day. But you want them to sit still, all proper with their Bible in their hand through a whole church service, and they've never been to church before. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. What, what, what challenges when you see when I, I do find it funny how they dictate about the pastor. And, you know, we both know an individual who's been through several, mm -hmm. several, several. <laughs> interviews, my yeah, God. Yeah. And my thing is, why don't the people pray? They say, God, who do you want to be here? What the, I mean, that's a two-edged sword. People say we pray because they know that's the church thing to mm -hmm. say. But people have an idea of what they want. Mm -hmm. And that's the danger of a, a people-led church. They always talk about what they want. And then years later, they blame God for what they had. Yeah. And if you would just step back and let God give you what he wanted you to have, there would be no complaints. Mm -hmm. But as long as people, people want what they want, they will always get a mess. Because the Bible says that God is not the author of confusion. Mm -hmm. So if there's confusion, who made it? Mm -hmm. We did. Yeah, we did, right. God didn't make it. Just like, you know, with uh, New Birth in Atlanta, there was a whole uproar on the internet about them having a succession plan for another preacher. Mm -hmm. How they going to do that? Where was the search committee at? Okay, <laughs> I've been reading the Bible a long time, and I haven't read the word search committee in the Bible yet. <laughs> but this is people's way of telling God how to do it. Mm -hmm. Moses had a succession plan. God gave it to him. Mm -hmm. Moses, when you dead, Joshua's going to be there. That was it. Elijah had a succession plan. When God took him away on the chariot of fire, Elisha was left behind. Jesus had a succession plan. When he went to heaven, he had 12 men that were going to carry out the gospel. Paul had a succession plan. When he left, Timothy was right there. The Bible has told us how church should run. Right. We've allowed somebody who done went to somebody's school to write a book on church searches. Mm -hmm. And now we think that that's the law of the land because somebody wrote a book on it. Mm -hmm. Which book is more important? This one or the one you bought mm -hmm. at um, 
church meetings are us. And we have to be careful because I see a lot of leaders, pastors, that are passing it on to their sons or trying to keep it in the family. Like it's a like it's a storefront store. Oh, yeah. Well, but what? But that's what if God's way to a downfall? Too. Right. But what if God didn't call them? What if? What if that's not who God wants? That and see, that's the, that's the danger of it. You can you can be um, wholeheartedly wrong. Mm -hmm. Just because you were there, don't mean that. Just because I'm the pastor at Saint Jack, don't mean that one of my sons gonna be the pastor. Right. Okay. But whoever God wants there, I have to be. Saying not my will, but your will be done, mm -hmm. and so does the church. You can't say, "Well, my name gonna be on the front of this for the rest for the next thirty <laughs> generations." Mm -hmm. It can't be that way. It's who God wants, always, and there's always evidence of whether or not it's God, because when it's God, there's growth behind it. Yes. When it's you, mm -hmm. yeah, because when it's God, it's an organism. Mm -hmm. When it's people, it's just an organization. Yeah, it's a country club. Yeah, yeah. Is, is exactly what it is. And it's it's sad that we're in that time. But it's not like God doesn't know. Oh, yeah. It's his will. Yeah. It's not like he doesn't know. Mm -hmm. You know, even even when Hezekiah, when he prayed, he got the mother years. Out of the mother years came another son. Yeah. Who didn't follow it <laughs> in the ways of God. That's right. You know, and destroyed everything right. that, was, that was set up before. So we have to be careful. Yeah, and you know, the main thing that's needed in the church today is Good, solid, biblical preaching. Mm -hmm. There's not much of that going on. And, you know, when you hear a good, solid, biblical preacher, they're called traditionalists and old school. And, mm -hmm. You know, because uh, everybody wanted their mind blown. Everybody want to leave with their missing at the top when they come to church. You know, <laughs> smoke coming out of their ears. Cause, oh, he just blew my mind. He just blew me away. I, I've never heard it that way before. Here, here's a book. That's been preached for well over 2,000 years. Mm -hmm. God tells you there's nothing new under the sun. But you're going to walk in church and somebody tell you, they go, oh, you just drop this in my spirit or something that ain't, God ain't never heard before. And you're like, oh, wow. Mm -hmm. But then you go home and you face the devil with that new stuff and the devil beats you still, down. You're still getting beat up. Because there ain't no foundation in it. It's like the seven sons of Skeeter. Mm -hmm. They're like, oh, yeah, we're going to do what they did. We're going to cast out demons. Then demons say, yep, Jesus we know. Mm -hmm. Paul we know. But who are you? Mm -hmm. And we, a lot of people fall into that line where the devil is like, yeah, I know Jesus. Mm -hmm. But the authority you're trying to come under don't even work here. So now I'm getting ready to tear you up. Mm -hmm. So we need solid. Pre I think the church would be in a better shape if preachers would stop being scared to pick up that Bible and preach that word. Mm -hmm. Instead of trying to preach something that's gonna please the people, you can't. You who are you gonna please? You are gonna please God, or you are gonna please the people? But mm -hmm. you can't do. You can't do both. You right. can't straddle the fence, or you are gonna get one of the fence posts in a place you don't want. <laughs> 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 so you got you got to please God. I'd mm -hmm. rather please God three hundred sixty five days a year, mm -hmm. die and go to heaven, than please people three hundred sixty five days a year. Mm -hmm. Gray hair, hair falling out, skinny. You you die be, and you, go you to be in a straitjacket. Yeah, you, you can't please jacket. everybody. Because when you're trying to please one person, what if their mind change? It's going to change. Now you got to change again for them to keep pleasing them to be acceptable? Yeah. No. Yeah. So we're chasing the wrong thing. We're chasing the wrong people mm -hmm. to be acceptable when you've already accepted by God. That's the only person that matters. We, mm -hmm. we serve an audience of one. There's a whole bunch of people with us, mm -hmm. but we only have one person. That's why the, the old hymn of the church means so much. They used to sing that song, A Charge to Keep I Have, mm -hmm. A God to Glorify. You know? And we got to think about that stuff. The only charge I have is to glorify God. Yeah. Not you. When I turn around and I'm trying to make you happy, I'm exposed in the back. Mm -hmm. That's when we get hit the most by the devil, when we turn our back trying to please somebody else. Yeah. Especially as a pastor. And then we get stunned. But I thought they loved me. Not man. <laughs> I, listen, I, tell, I tell young preachers all the time. They're going to say, man, pastor, we with you. And when mm -hmm. you're gone, they're going to say that to the next man. Yeah. It don't matter. You go to your anniversary. Oh, pastor, we love you. Pastor, we with you. They're going to say that to the next preacher, too. Mm -hmm. So why you don't put all of this premium every 
anniversary I go to, people say the same thing. <laughs> You're the greatest pastor we've ever had. It's true in that moment. But you can't put all of your eggs in that. You're the greatest we've ever had basket. Because you're still doing it for God's glory. Right. And until he says serving well done, you got some work to do. Just because you got a, a CD or you on TV don't mean you've arrived. When you've arrived, mm -hmm. that undertaker is going to be standing over you and that preacher is going to be saying ashes to ashes dust and to dust, dust to dust. Mm -hmm. Until then, you got some work to do. Get in your Bible. Study that word. Mm -hmm. I tell the preachers in our church all the time, every week you ought to be writing a sermon. Whether you preaching this week or not. Because mm -hmm. you got to work on your gift. Right. Iron sharpens iron, yes. But what are you putting that sword up against? Yeah, because you can't perfect it not doing nothing. Just because your pastor don't have you on the calendar to preach this month, you're going to wait until the Saturday before you have to preach and throw a sermon <laughs> together? That's what happens a lot of times. No. Oh. And so you're going to take that same mentality as a young preacher into the church you pastor. Mm -hmm. Every night, every Sunday, is going to be a Saturday night special. <laughs> Cramming. Cramming, Lord, what you want me to say? This ain't midterms in college. Mm -hmm. You got to study to show yourself approved mm -hmm. unto God. Workmen that need to be not be ashamed. Rightly divide the word truth. You, the word rightly divide in the Greek literally means to cut it straight. Mm -hmm. You can't cut it straight if you haven't been wielding that sword all week long. Right. And then you wonder where we get all these jack leg theologies in the church from. Mm -hmm. Well, like, everybody like this with they because it's too heavy for them. Because even even in your prayer time, your study time, your devotional time, and even in your meditation, mm -hmm. God is if you be still and listen, yeah, you will have something. So even if even if you say, you know what, you preaching today, you you're not gonna be oh, oh, shaking. You're like okay, the preachers at St. James know. I will wait till you show up to church on Sunday to say, hey, you feeling all right today? Because my pastor, Pastor Solomon Smith, used to do that. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, you're preaching today. You can't get sick now. <laughs> Your time with God is going to show when you mount yes. that pool field. Mm -hmm. Everybody want to know three weeks in advance. It don't work like that when you pastor. Somebody die on Sunday, you got a funeral on Friday. You got to teach Bible study on Wednesday. You got to preach a funeral on Friday and then preach a sermon on Sunday. Mm -hmm. Go visit the sick during the week. So you got to prepare yourself. Now is the time to prepare yourself. Right. You can't wait till you put in your resume to pastor to want to prepare yourself. Mm. And so this is the group of preachers that come up. These unprepared preachers that the churches have nobody else to choose from. Mm. Because they didn't prepare them. And now Going back to what we were talking about earlier, now they mad at the church. Oh, they they this and they that and they this. Well, what are they being fed? Mm -hmm. They all upset. Maybe what you feed them is upset in their stomach. You can't eat McDonald's four times a day, seven days a week without getting sick. Right. You can't eat candy all day, every day without losing some teeth and Becoming a diabetic. Mm -hmm. Same thing with the church. Every message ain't going to be, oh, we on our way to heaven and we so glad. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't be. Sometimes you're going to have to tell the church, if you don't get right, God going to remove the candlestick. Mm -hmm. well, we don't want to hear that, though. We want to make me smile, make me shout. Mm -hmm. Oh, he ain't shout me today. Well, that what you came here for? Feel good message. No, this ain't a microwave. Mm -hmm. I'm not, you know, you're not popcorn. We're not just going to press the button and you just start popping up all over the place. Your shouting comes from what's inside of you. If you haven't been shouting all week as you studied the Bible as a person in the pew, you ain't going to shout on Sunday. That's right. No matter what I say. That's just like worshiping. You, you ain't going to worship God. It, take, it takes a stronger pull on Sunday for everybody to come together if you haven't been doing it. Because yeah. if you've been doing it all week, you're going to be flowing in on Sunday. Most definitely. You're going to be flowing in. That's yeah, just yeah. like in, in the climate we live in. Let your car sit all week. I mean, all, all, all winter. Yeah. It ain't going to start. It ain't going to start. And it's the same way. And that's why it's almost like that pulling. You know, that's why, you know, those who have praise team leaders and those who lead devotion, whatever, it's, it's like 
you, it's like a cheerleader. Yeah. Trying to get you. And that's what it is. God. So that's so if I have to do this, what is your what is this saying about your relationship with God? Mm-hmm. You don't spend on, time even on worship leaders. Now we don't have worship leaders at our church, but when I look at worship leaders, um, you know, as a worship leader, if it's not in you, it's not going to resonate in me. Mm-hmm. So if you a worship leader and you've been living dirty all week, it don't matter how many times you say raise your hands and feel the spirit. If what's coming out of you is darkness, mm-hmm. all I see in that sanctuary is going to be darkness. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus told us, be careful that the light in you is not darkness. Mm-hmm. Be careful when you get up there as worship leader, as preacher. You can't preach over, you can't sing over your life. Mm, you can't true. out-preach who you are. Right. Monday through Saturday and get up on Sunday and you're going to be this great reverend doctor mm-hmm. or worship leader, pastor, or worship so-and-so. Mm-hmm. No, who you are every day of the week mm-hmm. is who you are right, on, on Sunday. Sunday. Yeah. You can't change that. Ain't no quick prayer and no office going to change <laughs> the devil you've been mm-hmm. all week. Yeah, God's word not going to go out and come back void, mm-hmm. but that don't mean that it's going to, uh, you're going to be filled with the spirit. Right. That people going to get it. They may, a few sermons down the line from somebody else, they may get what you said, but they missed it that day because of what was on you. Mm-hmm. So that's people, what Psalms 15, when it's talking about, you know, who can ascend? Yeah. Before his presence, those with clean hands and a pure heart. Yeah, that's the sacrifice so, so of the you, Lord. That's so if, if you're dirty during a week, even your worship before God is dirt. And that's the thing. Romans 12. He said, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you present your body mm-hmm. a living sacrifice. That means every day you alive, mm-hmm. you ought to be presenting yourself to God. Not just on Sunday. Mm-hmm. How you going to, this is the thing. We think that whatever we give God on Sunday, he going to be all right with <laughs> Because I gave it to him. Mm-hmm. God accept my worship. God accept my prayer. He doesn't have to accept it because you say accept it. Right. That's why presents on your birthday come with gift receipts. Because <laughs> if you don't want it, mm-hmm. take it back. <laughs> so if we have gifts that we don't want and we'll take them back, what do you think God is going to do? We didn't just come up with that idea out of mm-hmm. the blue. That's inherent from the God that created us. Mm-hmm. He not going to look at Cain and Abel. Cain gave a sacrifice that God wasn't pleased with. Right. Abel gave a more acceptable sacrifice. And just like Cain and Abel in church, when I see that the spirit on you and Pastor Andre preaching like a maniac, everybody flocking to his church, I'm going to be like Cain. I'm going to try to kill you. Mm-hmm. That's what preachers do. And that kills me. Just because you hot and the church, your church is growing, don't mean I need to go out and slander you and kill you and try to steal mm. your members and find dirt on you and right. post it on Facebook. That ain't how you grow in God. That what what example are you giving to the world by doing that? And that's not spiritual maturity. The Bible says big time. the Bible tells us that love covers a multitude of sins. Mm-hmm. So if I found out something about Pastor Andre that wasn't too hot, I'm supposed to love Pastor Andre. Mm-hmm. Not go to his people and say, see this is the reason why you ought to be in my church. Because mm. he look what he doing. Forgetting that the Bible says all have sinned, not y'all, but mm-hmm. all. Oh. And so we have to understand that just because I'm hot or you hot or whoever's hot in their church is growing, don't mean there's something wrong with you. All growth ain't healthy growth. That's right. I mean, I'm I'm a good 165 today. I come back three weeks from now and I'm 290. You gonna swear something wrong oh, with me? Exactly. Man, you blowing up. That ain't a good blower. Mm-hmm. It ain't muscle. I'm doing something wrong. And that's how we need to take a look at the church. How is your church growing? Mm-hmm. Is it healthy growth? Or y'all just blowing up? Right. Because when people, a lot of pastors, they want that increase. But are you prepared for the increase? God is not going to take you beyond what you can handle. John Maxwell calls it the law of the lead. Every organization, specifically the church, has a lead. Mm-hmm. If you're going to grow beyond that lead, you have to understand how to take it off and where to set. You just can't take it off and throw the lid to the side. Mm -hmm. It's going to spill everywhere. You have to know that God has led me to this point. Okay? I'm not, the church is not going to grow beyond what I can handle. Right. 
So if you're not equipping your church while it's small to serve big, mm -hmm. it's right. only going to grow to a certain point, then it's going to stop. Mm -hmm. Because nobody is prepared to serve beyond that. Then, you know, successful pastors need to be reading. You know, mm -hmm. get, get a book. Yeah. Reverend, everything ain't going to come out the sky. Dr. Matt King Carter said revelation comes from when you put your butt in a chair and a book in your face. Mm -hmm. You want to know how to be successful? Uh, go find you a pastor that's doing the model that you're trying to do. Study. Talk to him. Don't just sit in his church and look at what he does and be like, take a note. Oh, if I change from doing devotion to praise and worship, the church going to grow. My church does devotion every single Sunday and we we growing every week. Mm -hmm. You got to know what's right for your setting. That's right. So you talk That's to that right. pastor and you ask that pastor, how did he come to that point? Mm -hmm. You just can't go to your church and turn it upside down because he doing it and you want to be like him. You know, I love Pastor Marvin Wine, mm -hmm. but I can't go in and turn St. James into perfecting. I love my pastor, Dr. South, Dr. Atella Chapman, but I can't turn St. James into Galilee. I have to know my setting. Right. That's a part of growth. You got to know your setting. Especially for, and I know I'm all over the place. No, no, you good. Uh, especially for preachers that come out of town into a new community. Before you talk about evangelizing the community and growing your church, you need to spend some time understanding the setting that your Thank church you. is in. Thank you. Yes, you do. Okay? Because if your church is in the middle of a crack neighborhood, guess who's going to walk in your doors on Sunday? It sure won't be the judges and the lawyers. Mm -hmm. It's going to be them people in your setting. So you have to be able to reach those people that's around you. That's your Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. If we follow in the Acts chapter 1 model, the, going to your Jerusalem, Samaria, to mm -hmm. the other most parts of the world, what's in your Jerusalem? Then what's in your, what's outside of that area? Right. But you have to be all things to everybody. Mm -hmm. You just can't get up there preaching to the upper echelon because those lower people, they don't understand all the Greek, Hebrew, mm -hmm. and Latin. They're going <laughs> to walk out of the door. Right. So I can have all the seminary in the world. I can pick up a Greek Bible and read it with the best of it. But when I step in the pulpit at St. James on Sunday morning, it's got to be practical. Because that's what Jesus did. Mm -hmm. When he was around fishermen, he talked about fishing. Right. When he was around farmers, he talked about farming. When he, talked to, when he was around the street people, he talked about forgiveness. Mm -hmm. He could have talked about heavenly things just straight up, but they wouldn't have got them. So he had to speak their language. He had to tell stories. Thank God for your degree. Right. But that degree was for you. Exactly. <laughs> it means nothing when you get in that pulpit mm -hmm. if people can't digest what you're saying. Right. You're speaking little words that they don't even think about. It's like go, go can't, on. Even, can't even comprehend. Yeah. It's like coming to America and all you speak is German. Unless there's somebody out there that knows what you're saying. That's the only person you're talking to. Mm -hmm. Hmm. So you wonder why everybody up and live when the choir is singing and then they sleep when you preach. <laughs> check, check your practicality. Mm -hmm. Jesus was practical. Mm -hmm. He could have been higher and talking over their head if he wanted to. But he didn't do that. He talked practical. Everybody that Jesus ministered to wanted to follow him. Not based on what he did, but based on what he said. Right. He found a man from the Gadarenes in Mark chapter 5, healed that man, the demon, told that man, the man said, listen, Jesus, I want to go with you. I want to be wherever you are. Mm -hmm. Jesus told that man something that just blew my mind. Because if we find somebody on the street and we talk to them about Jesus, they get saved. We think they automatically got to be a member of our church. Jesus said, no, you go on. Mm -hmm. You tell your family and friends the good things that the Lord has done for you. That's practical. That ain't me trying to gather up my bag full of sheep and everywhere I go, I'm just sucking up another sheep for me. Mm -hmm. No. How about telling that person to go home? Talk to your family and friends. Because that's true evangelism. Yes, it is. Not being able to quote every scripture in the Bible, but to be able to tell somebody what God did for you. And if you can't do that, <laughs> you need to go back to the altar. Because that's what um, I have witnessed where some pastors have because their heart is for souls. Mm -hmm. And it's not, they're not concerned about being quote unquote a member here. Because this, this might not be the place. This might be 
your your divine time to mm-hmm. receive God. But your you know your place could be somewhere else. That's right. Yeah. And it's okay. Yeah. You know, it's like people get upset when when members leave. Okay. And go somewhere else. Not your church. But my mindset is as long as you're in the body, you all right. You all right with me. You are all right, man. Listen. Well, what you need my blessings for if you you, you, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. You're already in the Bible. So if, if I was a pastor and you come to me, you you know, pastor, you know, I think it's, you know, I feel the Lord saying it's time for me to go. Okay. God bless. God bless you. Come back anytime to visit. You're more than welcome. More than welcome. No, no, hard I, no hard feelings. I ain't going to sit there and get on the phone. I hate that. You know? People he, treat you different and, when you leave. And, and be like, he was nothing when he, now this, I heard that about me years ago in the 90s. He was nothing when he came here. How you know? Now he done rose up. Yeah, who died and made you the the measuring stick for who somebody and, is? And, and now he want to go somewhere. And then when I left, I went to pastors that were Caucasian, Italian. How they gonna minister to him? But I grew because the things I learned there, I knew I would learn mm-hmm. there. But God knew that. Yeah, God knew that. Yeah. God knows. The path, yeah, you know, for each individual, and you have to be able to trust God. You have to, you know. There was a, there was a, well, she's a mother at the church now, and this is how she put it. She said, "Everybody has a break. Mm-hmm. You know, some people are the foundation, and they're gonna be there the rest of their life. Some people come, you know, sporadically here and there, and they stay for a season, and then they're gone." And we have to accept, but as long as you're in the body of Christ, as long as you're my brother, now if you say, you know, Pastor, I'm thinking about, you know, being a Muslim, brother, let's talk. Yeah. <laughs> now that's when it's time. Right. To that's talk. when it's time to talk. When you talk about abandoning mm-hmm. faith. That's when we need to talk, but, but not because the Lord is leading you somewhere else. And this is the thing that I go on. You always, if it's the Lord leading you, mm-hmm. you're going to stay wherever you're going. Mm-hmm. But if you just upset with something you heard in church, you're going to start hopping. Yeah. Because if God didn't tell you to leave, the same thing he was teaching you at the one church, the preacher that you go to, he's going to be teaching the same thing. <laughs> he gonna, you're going to hear it until you get it. Mm-hmm. You're going to be hopping. You're doing a Jonah now. You're supposed to be in Nineveh. Now you're trying to go to Joppa. Right. You know, and by the time you get out of this fish, you're going to be right back where you started. Mm-hmm. So we got to make sure that God is speaking to us. And that's where, you know, Sometimes that dropping in my spirit thing can be dangerous. Because <laughs> God ain't the only one doing the dropping. It's sure ain't. Care. He ain't the only voice that's talking. I, I, some people say that to me and I instantly say, hmm, I don't know. Well, God dropped this in my spirit. Did he? What does God's voice sound like? Mm-hmm. That's dangerous. You just can't get up in the pool, especially as preacher. Let me drop this in your spirit. I instantly shut my ears off when somebody say that. Mm. You ain't getting ready to drop nothing on this. Mm. Okay? Because if God want me to have it, he going to speak it to me. Mm-hmm. And it ain't going to be because of you dropping something off there. Where did that term even come from? Right. But it's so much stuff that we pick up from the world. Yeah. And we bring it in the church. And ain't nobody in the world trying to bring our stuff. No. When did the world... And that's... <laughs> Man, that's a whole other subject in itself. We, the church so much tries to conform to the world to win the world. But we win the world by being different. Yes. By being different. You don't have to have no, I'm trying to think of the best way to say this without turning off the Facebook audience. No, just say it. <laughs> just speak it, man. You don't have to have all of these foolish programs and nights in the church to win people, okay? A singles ministry in the church ain't nothing but the dating game in the church. Mm. That's all it is. It's a way for the hoes in the church to hole around under the banner of Christ. Mm, my God. I'm sorry, Facebook. My God. Mm-hmm. But that's what it is. When God talks about being united in marriage, not getting single people together under the banner of Christ to do their single thing. That's the, the dating game mm-hmm. is the world thing. Right. That's a club thing. You go to the club to do the dating game. You come to the church to have your life strengthened. Yes. 
We can't build marriages because we're trying to satisfy the world's demand. Oh, you can't preach this sin because, you know, my son and my daughter, they doing that. Oh, you, I can't preach this sin because, you know, I'm the pastor and I, I'm doing this little dirt on the side. So mm -hmm. I'm going to talk about this sin. No, that's not good. Right. You either going to preach it all or you're going to preach none. That's right. Stop having these mixers in the church and all of this crap in the church. We watching worldly movies in the church just so we can invite our worldly friends mm -hmm. to it. Go to the bowling alley. Invite your worldly friend to the bowling alley. Mm -hmm. You know? Go go to the movie at the Star Theater if you want to have your worldly friends interact with church people. Don't bring them in God's mm -hmm. house because you change God's house into something that is not. That's right. Then they start contaminating. Then it becomes to look like you. Mm -hmm. Smell like you. This is my church. This is my pew. Mm -hmm. My family built this. You know, in memory of... <laughs> out of here. Right. What, the only person, only thing that you say in memory of is that communion table, in remembrance of mm -hmm. me. Not no pew in memory of my uncle or mm -hmm. no flower pot in memory of my sister. <laughs> <laughs> but that's just me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, before, before we close, <laughs> Jesus. Oh, man, I'm about to give you some gas to come back. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, share share a, a quick word of hope for those who may be just struggling with the whole ch church, the body of Christ itself. Um, just you know, real quick, one of my teachers on Monday night was so devastated because she saw some things behind the scenes. And when I look at her, I can just see the devastation on her. Where now she's just you know she's visiting another church now. So, you know, we got people with church hurt, you know, and the worst kind of hurt, the worst kind of hurt because that's not that's not your expectation mm -hmm. when, when you come to the house of God. Yeah. You know, but those who may say, you know what, I ain't coming to another church again. You know, we got church folk. We got Christians who don't even go to another church again. Mm -hmm. where they, hey, let's have church at home. Yeah. yeah. You know, and forget about all the, the politics, the rules, the regulations. All this man-made stuff, and let's just have Jesus. Yeah, and then you spring up a hurt church. Yeah. You know, your church plan is a church hurt plan. Mm -hmm. You know, and then all you're doing is you are basically an AA meeting for recovering mm -hmm. church people. Wow. And you're really not the church. Mm -hmm. You know, um, church is the only place where we shoot the wounded. The only yeah. place. You know, two drunks walk down the street, one drunk fall, the other one gonna stop and pick him up. Two church people walk down the street, one of them fall, they're gonna be like, you must not be as saved as you thought you were. <laughs> That's true. So my word of encouragement would just come from uh, whenever I want uh, encouragement. Two scriptures come to mind. Uh, the first one, uh, the psalmist says in Psalm 121, I will lift up my eyes to the hills from whence comes my help. My help comes from the Lord. That statement right there is not a I might lift my eyes mm -hmm. I could lift my eyes. He says, I will. There's a lot of stuff that keep my head down. I go mm -hmm. through a lot of stuff that keep me looking down. But when I could look down, I will look up. Because that's where my help comes from. Right. All the, the bad stuff that's happening around is happening down here. But if you lift up, if you look up, you'll find your help. And I think that a lot of people in church need to stop looking around mm, and start that's looking good. up. That's good. Then the psalmist says, when my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that's higher than I. And I think all the time that there needs to be somebody close to these people that are hurting that can lead them to the rock. Mm -hmm. Don't lead them into a secret meeting where y'all can discuss how much you both hate the pastor or hate these ministries going on in church, mm -hmm. but lead them to Jesus. Yes. Because that's what Hurting people's need. And brother and sister, wherever you are today, I want to tell you that God is there for you. He loves you. And all you got to do is make it to him. And whatever hurts you have, whatever pains you have, if you bring them to Jesus, he'll handle them. Really? May not fall off overnight, but I guarantee you he'll handle mm -hmm. them. He said, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, mm -hmm. and I will give you rest. Mm -hmm. That's one thing everybody in the church needs from time to time. Is a little relief. Mm -hmm. Even a hot water heater 
That's a pressure mm-hmm. relief. Yes, valve. it does. When it's too much pressure for mm-hmm. that hot water heater to handle, that valve kick in and knock out some of the pressure. That's who Jesus is. That's the Holy Spirit for us. He takes some of those pressures. Paul says in Romans, we don't know what to pray for, but God understands our groaning. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so just know God is listening. Mm-hmm. He's there for you. All you got to do is look up. Don't look around you. Look up. Look up to him. You sinking right now because you start looking at everything else. Look up and he'll lift you up. Amen. Yes, sir. Amen. Amen. Tell me about your church. Where is it at? Address? Okay. Service times? Uh, I am the pastor of St. James Missionary Baptist Church in Pontiac, Michigan, located at 345 Bagley uh, in the city of Pontiac. Uh, we worship on Sundays at 11 o'clock. We have Bible study on Wednesday night at 6 and then on Thursday morning at 12 noon. We even have a ministry for our young people on Friday nights at 6 o'clock. So we encourage those of you in the Pontiac surrounding area to come and join us Sunday at 11, Wednesday at 6, Thursday at noon, or with the children ages 5 to 17 on Friday nights at 6 o'clock. Amen. Yeah. Amen. And um, those who don't know Christ, maybe have fallen away from Christ, what would you say? Uh, I would tell you today, if you don't know Christ, for me, He's the greatest person to know. He's the only person I know who can forgive you for whatever you've done, whenever you did it. Uh, He loves you regardless of who you are and where you are. Uh, He said in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. In verse 17, he said, I didn't come to condemn the world, but that the world through me might be saved. And I know you feel like what you've done is beyond anybody forgiving because so many people have told you that they'll never be able to forgive you. But I want you to know that God will forgive you. And you gain his forgiveness by accepting him as Lord and Savior, believing in him with all of your heart and confessing him as your Savior. It's just that simple. It's not hard. You don't have to swing across hell's fire on spider web. You don't have to go lock yourself in a closet in a dark room until your eyesight and your voice changes. All you have to do is accept him as your Lord and Savior. And if you confess your sin, whatever it is, he'll forgive you of it. And the Bible says, if any man's in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things passed away and behold, all things are new. And if you've been away from church because you are something that was said that uh, didn't rub you the right way, two things I want to share with you today. Remember, why you do what you do. You don't do it for the people. And remember, number two, it's never too late to come back home. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for coming out. Thank you for um, having me. Appreciate you so much. Um, as always, um, I want to talk about Safe Line. Safe Line, so many people are, are, are bound up. And like you said about the pressure point, being able to release. And a lot of times when they, the enemy was telling them, you know, that you're doomed and got all these voices talking in your head where well, you're going crazy and you just need someone to talk to. Mm-hmm. So I came up with SafeLine. Okay. SafeLine, I don't, I don't have to know your name or anything, but it's a place where if you need someone to have an ear to hear, mm-hmm. they can call this number. Okay. It's a second line to my cell phone. And that number is 586-698-7234. SafeLine is a safe place because young kids are committing suicide. Um, Pastors are committing suicide. Mm-hmm. Um, there was a husband I heard, a friend of mine, I think it's somewhere in the Pontiac area, he committed suicide because his business was going under. IRS was coming after him. You kill yourself. Now you done left everything for your wife and you got a five-year-old son mm. without a dad. Mm. Just the pressures of life. Oh, they'll weigh you down. They'll, they'll weigh you down. And sometimes we need, even us as ministers and preachers, you know, we need someone that we can just, hey, Doc, I just need to talk. Mm-hmm. You know, and I heard T.D. Jake say, um, listening is a ministry. Because mm-hmm. sometimes we don't have to say anything. They just want to talk. Yeah. And we have to be able to know when to say something and when to shut up. Mm-hmm. And then, believe it or not, if you let them talk, they don't talk their whole self. <laughs> they don't got the answer. They don't know what to do. They be like, thank you. Like, I didn't do nothing but listen. Mm-hmm. But that's so important, though. Yeah. Listening is important. It is. So I just want to thank each and every one of you for tuning in. Glory to God. We'll be back next week. I got a prophet, Cedric, young man of God, 
on fire for the Lord in Detroit. Um, very unique. Um, some people call themselves prophet, but he's a true prophet of God, a young man, very knowledgeable in some things that's just beyond, just, you know, everybody has that lane that God calls him. Yeah. He, he's in his lane. All right. And it's so important for us to be in our lane. This yeah. is my lane here. Yes, it's to encourage, to uplift, to motivate. You know, we all have our lane, but all that lane heads into one place, That's right. which is Jesus Christ. That's right. Instead of working against each other, you know, hey, I need you. Yeah. You know, that's why, you know, you got you have a general physician. OK, but I need a referral to go to the eye doctor. Yeah. Specialists. yeah. <laughs> right. I, you know, we got specialists yeah. in the body of Christ. And so the more that we can depend on one another, pull on one another, and then the more we can equip mm -hmm. the body of Christ. That's what we're supposed to do. Yeah. Equip, equip the body. So, you know, I might say, hey, Pastor, I need you over here because I, I need you to talk about this realm because I know this is your expertise. Mm -hmm. I know this is your gift in this area. There's no hating. There's no nothing. It's my brother. You know, we're That's supposed right. to be workers. That's right. You know, Working together. Here. Yeah. You know, toward um, just like a relay. You know, I used to run a 440 relay when I was your size. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I was the anchor. Yeah. But, you know, you had to hand the baton off. And it was timing. It's precision, so it's even knowing knowing the timing of God and when to do something mm -hmm. and how to go about it. So it's so important. So once again, thank you, man. Yeah. And I love you regardless love you. of my high school colors that represent Ohio State. Hey, O-H. <laughs> I know. All right, until next time. Amen. God bless you all. Thanks for tuning in. Appreciate you, God. Thanks for having me. No problem, man. Hope I was helping you. 